thank you so much for having me and for the for the very kind introduction. I'm, it's really a thrill to be here at the uh, at the main campus. Uh, so yeah, very exciting. Um, I didn't know I was going to have to say what it is that we add. Maybe it's heart. Maybe it's just a great group place to visit. <laughs> um, but anyways, thanks so much for coming out, and, I, and I'm excited to share this with you. Uh, one thing that I'm quite excited about, so I want to do a bit of a, an introduction and talk broadly about um, cannabis, a little bit of how we got there. It's always tough to really um, pick the appropriate level uh, when talking about cannabis because there's such a broad interest. So I want to I start big and then sort of narrow it down. Uh, and it's going to be mostly focused on, on, I think, public health perspective. So, you know, we could talk about the endocannabinoid system. I'm happy to chat about uh, uh, about that uh, later and, and hope, hope, look forward to making time to chat with you afterwards. I'll, I'll be around for the afternoon. Um, but for now, we're gonna, I'm going to talk broadly. And, and the exciting thing is I've got a lot of unpublished uh, data, some new data that I'm going to be presenting for the first time here. So I'm um, really, uh, really happy to be able to do that. Some of the stuff that we've got from the pre-post uh, legalization studies that we're doing. So preliminary findings, I, don't, I'll, I hope you'll, you'll recognize them as such and, and wait for the peer-reviewed publication when it comes out. But when it does come out, you can say, oh, I already know that. Um, so disclosures, first of all, uh, I have received support from licensed producers of cannabis uh, for a clinical trial of cannabis for PTSD that we're running. Of course, uh, that's how you have to do a clinical trial of cannabis for PTSD. Um, so, uh, and you know, for a long time there, there was very little support for, little to no support for uh, federally funded research looking at anything but harm. So, uh, as someone with an interest in, in the therapeutic use of cannabis, uh, licensed producers are, are pretty much where we had to go, and I'm grateful for their support. I don't get any direct financial support. They don't pay any bills for me. Um, the research has funded some of my graduate students, so it's made life easier for them. Um, so uh, I've also, the research you're going to see today is also funded by CHR, SHRC, MyTax, and the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention uh, at UBC. And they've done some really great stuff for me. So, uh, overview today, I'm going to briefly touch on the use of cannabis as a medicine. For some of you, this will be uh, old news. For others, uh, perhaps a, a little bit of new material, I hope. I want to talk about what I see as some of the public health potential that comes from um, liberalized access to cannabis, looking at cannabis uh, substitution in public health. So. Uh, one of the shortcomings, I think, of so much prior work on cannabis is that we look at cannabis in isolation uh, and not looking at how it impacts the use of other substances. And as a behaviorist and coming at things from a behavioral economic perspective broadly, we know that when uh, access to a given substance is uh, liberalized, that can sometimes uh, result in either uh, exacerbation of other substance use or reduction. So we'll talk a little bit about cannabis as a substitute and what that might mean for public health. Then I'll present some of those preliminary findings on legalization and how that impacts on, on some of that other stuff. Talk about some new methodological uh, developments that, that are coming out of our lab um, for measuring cannabis in a new context. And I'll briefly touch on some future directions of where, where our research is, is going to be going, hopefully over the next five, ten years. So. One thing that I, that I always want everyone to come away from a talk on cannabis is just how old uh, the allegiance between humans and cannabis is. So some of the first record, it, it may be that cannabis is the oldest uh, uh, plant used for, for medicinal purposes. Uh, the, all, the, all the oldest, earliest reports go back to uh, prehistory and into legend. So, about 5,000 years ago, we got some of the first reports in the, um, of cannabis use in China uh, associated with uh, Shen Neng, who was a mystical sage deity emperor of early China, and um, reports of Shen Neng favoring the use of cannabis. So it, we have conservatively about 5,000 years of human cannabis use. And throughout that time, there have been in various places and, and various eras different levels of prohibition and allowance of cannabis. Um, and I think that we're going to be looking back on this last hundred or so years of prohibition of cannabis as really a blip in what is a millennia-long uh, association and, and I, I would say allegiance between cannabis and humans. One thing that was early recognized in, in some of the, the first accounts of cannabis is this is one of the only plants that could be used as a medicine, as a fuel from the oil, as a food, and as a fiber. 
So uh, it was ubiquitous um, back in those times in China. Shortly after that, we have evidence from India, which has the longest uninterrupted use of cannabis as a medicine, uh, still being used to this day, particularly in terms of uh, uh, a concoction of cannabis called bong, cannabis associated with the god Shiva, who is, uh, is seen in this image as mixing up bong. So it's crushing up the trichomes that include the, the THC, the active ingredient, the other cannabinoids as well, CBD. Um, crushing them up with, uh, with, with an oil and, um, and using that as a medicine. And, and to this day, you can get bong in certain areas of India. Not, not ubiquitous throughout India. Certain regions, it's more popular than others. Um, it becomes most popular around uh, the festival of Holi, where it's widely, widely used. Uh, and the Vedas, which also date back to antiquity, uh, unknown origin, um, describe cannabis as a source of happiness, a joy giver, a liberator, compassionately given to humans to help us to attain delight and lose fear. And I'm not here to promote cannabis use. We'll leave that to the Vedas. Um, but I think it's interesting when we look at these early reports of cannabis use that they do really focus on a medicinal and positive use of cannabis. You might also notice the term ganja there. Many of you probably associate that with Jamaican. Uh, use of cannabis, but that term came from the early uh, immigrants to Jamaica from India who brought their customary cannabis use along with them. So ganja is actually uh, a term that comes from India, not, not Jamaica. Then it refers to the buds, the medicinal part of the cannabis plant, as opposed to the stalks which are used for fiber and the seeds which are used for fuel and food. Um, also worth noting is charas, has a long history of use there, and charas is essentially hash or finger hash. The reason why I think it's important that we acknowledge this long-term use of this cannabis concentrate is there's a lot of attention paid to the super weed, fears about super weed, that today's weed is so much more powerful than the weed that your parents had and just because it wasn't harmful for you doesn't mean it's not going to be the assassin of youth this time around because it's so much stronger and different. The fact is there have been uh, millennia of use of high potency THC products. So there's really nothing new about the new cannabis that's mostly hype. It's true that some of the cannabis um, that gets taken by police, the THC levels in the samples have gone up, uh, but it's not entirely novel to have high THC products. So cannabis comes to Europe from India, in the middle of the 1800s. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, a well-respected physician, noticed the great medicinal potential of cannabis and brought it to Europe where it was widely adopted uh, in a variety of over-the-counter medicines. Uh, I, also, if you're interested in, in up-to-date information on medicinal cannabis use, uh, there's a website and an organization that was around even before it was a website called O'Shaughnessy's that uh, their interface is not the most contemporary, but they've got a lot of good uh, resources for studying medical cannabis and named after, after Dr. O'Shaughnessy, who brought cannabis um, to the United Kingdom where it was uh, enthusiastically uptaken by uh, the court of Queen Victoria. There is some controversy regarding just how enthusiastic of a cannabis uh, consumer Queen Victoria was. Some reports say that she used cannabis regularly. What we do know for sure is that, the, uh, that her court physician was a, was a strong advocate for the medical use of cannabis. You know, we can, we can, we can debate just how accurate uh, or appropriate uh, British Columbia is as a title for this area. You know, it was, it's neither British nor Colombian, discuss. Um, but I think we can, we can celebrate that, that the capital city is named after a strong female cannabis advocate. <laughs> Seems appropriate. So all this went along just fine until about the 1930s, 1920s in fact, to be uh, more exact where we came across cannabis prohibition. And it's interesting, this is where we first started to see the emergence of the term marijuana. And one of the reasons why many of us who research cannabis, particularly therapeutic uh, use of cannabis, uh, take exception to the term marijuana. It was sort of a rebranding exercise at the time in the US. There was concern about uh, immigration from the South, imagine that. Uh, that people would come from Mexico and, and there was concern that they would bring 
immoral behavior and crime with them. So we haven't come that far now. We still have those kind of xenophobic attitudes. And um, they're attaching, uh, tried to, to uh, couple this with fear of, of cannabis. So they renamed it marijuana, give it a, give it a, a Spanish name. And, you know, if you ever doubt that as an individual you can have a profound effect on the course of society, look no further than Harry Anslinger, uh, the one person who is perhaps uh, uniquely responsible for the war on cannabis. He took it on uh, as a personal, uh, a personal cause. Uh, we could talk for a while about some of his motivations. He was associated with a number of large corporations that had interests that were competitive with what was then a very active hemp industry. And when we look at some of the regulations that are just now clearing up around producing hemp, which is non-psychoactive, but which is great for making paper and oil and, and, and other products, um, it's really hard not to think that, that something's up because there's really no reason to prohibit the growth of hemp, even if you are concerned about the psychoactive use of cannabis. Um, so anyways, Aslinger not only tied cannabis to, um, to fears about immigration, but he really took this nugget that we see continuing through this day that cannabis is going to cause madness or insanity. And, and since I'm going to be talking about cannabis and mental health, I think it's important that we address the genesis of this idea that cannabis is, in fact, a shortcut to the insane asylum. Uh, smoke marijuana cigarettes for a month, and it was once your brain will be nothing but a storehouse of horrid specters. I've never been to a storehouse of horrid specters, but I don't think it would be a very good place. Uh, it makes a murderer who kills for the love of killing out of the mildest mattered man. So, I mean, how does he really feel? We'll never know. Um, around the same time, we have reefer mats. That's actually a picture of Aslinger. Or, no, it's Pinocchio. Um, but they were contemporaries, I believe. And we see, you know, this wasn't just in the U.S. Uh, here in Canada, we had Janie Canuck, Judge Emily Murphy, who, who did some, some, certainly some positive things in her career. Uh, but also uh, was, you know, at, at, at core of prohibitionists and, and worked together with Aslinger and U.S. authorities to stoke fears of cannabis and tie them to migrants. In, here in Vancouver, it was tied to, uh, to migrants from Asia, immigrants from Asia. Um, but the same story, tying this cannabis use to wild and outlandish criminal behaviors from at the, what were at the time exotic groups. And unfortunately, we're still, seeing, uh, we're still seeing some resurgence of this meme. Malcolm Gladwell has recently published some uh, spurious work from uh, Alex Berenson, a friend of his who's a psychiatrist who has a friend who heard a story about someone who smoked cannabis and became psychotic and went on a murderous rampage. So strangely enough, we're seeing some of these same, um, same things being, being raised today. And, and really, um, you know, I think in the case of someone like Gladwell, it's about being a contrarian and sort of a backlash to, oh, you thought cannabis was safe, well, not so fast. But really, that, that has been really discredited, what he said even recently. So um, not the first time. I mean, anyone remember broken windows policing? Not a good idea. Uh, but a meme, nonetheless, from Malcolm Gladwell. So that's the history, and I want to talk now about the therapeutic resurgence. So what I hope I've demonstrated, at least in, in, a, in a rough way, is, is that the use of cannabis uh, has a long history as a therapeutic. You know, as I said, perhaps one of the earliest therapeutic plants. Um, and for a long time, it was only considered a drug of abuse. And I think that for many of us, and, and I include myself there, someone who is studying substance use, um, you know, for the last... 15 or so years early in my career, as much as I was um, on board with legalization and, and drug policy, I was somewhat skeptical of cannabis as a, as a therapeutic agent. Um, I received some funding from the Institute of Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention early on to do a survey of medical cannabis users, and this was uh, one of the earliest surveys of medical cannabis users in Canada. And what we saw was that people were using for sleep and for pain, and those are both indications that we know, uh, particularly for pain, there's, there's good evidence that cannabis can be effective for chronic pain, not so much for acute pain, um, but I was surprised as a clinical psychologist to see it being used so much for anxiety and depression. It was my thought that at best cannabis would be neutral in those conditions and it perhaps exacerbating. So it was curious to see so many people reporting it effective for these conditions. And of course, this is self-report, and this was 
uh, research that was drawn from medical cannabis users. So at that time, particularly when we looked at medical cannabis users, there were great barriers to accessing cannabis for medical purposes. So we get an overrepresentation of positive responders, people who found cannabis to be effective. If you didn't find cannabis to be effective, it was unlikely that you were going to go through the rigmarole of accessing it. So um, I'm not going to show the, uh, the self-reported efficacy. Nonetheless, these are the reasons why people said they were using it. And um, it directed me to examine this further. And around the same time, uh, a lot of my colleagues who are clinical psychologists were saying, I'm seeing patients who are saying they're using cannabis for anxiety, and they say it helps, but how do I understand? What do I tell them? We've always been told that any cannabis use is pathological, uh, and you know, if you're fortunate, you might get away without any negative consequences. But the idea that it could actually be helpful uh, seemed quite exotic at the time. So it seemed time to do a review. What do we really know? What did we know at this time? This is just a few years old. There's been a little bit of research since then, but I think it's still a pretty comprehensive review from clinical psych review. And what we did in this review is we looked at uh, all the research we could find on the use of cannabis for therapeutic purposes, primarily self-report from Australia, a lot of it from California, also a couple studies from Canada and a few from the UK. Altogether, we got about 24,000 uh, respondents in the review. Um, so when people say there's no research, it's not that there's no research, it's that there's very few clinical trials, and if we're going to use clinical trials as the only, uh, as the only allowable evidence, then yes, there's very little research, but if we can take broad population studies, which I, I could argue that I think we should, uh, there's actually a fair bit of research on how people and why people use cannabis uh, for medical purposes. Well, there's also, of course, a broad literature on non-medical cannabis use, so broad that there's no way to systematically uh, examine it, so we just did a meta-review of non-medical cannabis use. And there's a big caution that comes with research on non-medical cannabis use. First of all, that cannabis has been prohibited, so there's a prohibition bias in that folks who uh, are willing to break the law or who are in contexts where illegal activities are more standard, are likely to have another uh, number of other characteristics, increased antisociality, negative affect, et cetera, that really complicates our evaluation of these studies when we think about therapeutic use. Nonetheless, we didn't think it should be ignored. So I'll give you uh, some of the findings from this, particularly with the most endorsed categories. The number one most endorsed is anxiety, as you saw from our review. People use cannabis uh, to reduce anxiety, and if we look even in uh, non-therapeutic studies, we see that people report relaxing, chilling out, what have you, to, uh, as a motivation for using cannabis. And um, not surprisingly, we also see this amongst medical users. So the eight cross-sectional studies of medical users that looked at the use for anxiety, in all the studies, people reported relief of anxiety as a primary or secondary benefit of using cannabis. In one study that had some control, uh, the anxiety returned after cannabis cessation. So that suggests that cannabis is indeed dampening anxiety, not unlike benzodiazepines. And I think that that's really some research that we need to see done down the road. How does cannabis stack up to benzos? Benzos are, of course, very imperfect drugs themselves with their own risk profile. So how do we compare the relative risks and benefits of cannabis to benzodiazepines uh, to be studied? Amazing that it hasn't been done yet. We also saw two reviews of non-medical use, and they show a, a small positive association between baseline anxiety and cannabis use. Cannabis use in, in these cases is not being carefully measured, and I'll get to that later as well. Um, but even these reviews um, weren't, were not able to assert any kind of causal association despite the uh, voluminous research on cannabis and anxiety trying to find a, a negative uh, association or a positive association between cannabis and more anxiety. Um, there's never been a shortage of funding to find problems with cannabis use, which is part of what makes it, I think, somewhat remarkable that we don't have more of a smoking gun when it comes to the harms of cannabis uh, because there's been a lot of motivation to find it. When we look at depression, we see a very similar profile. Cross-sectional studies of therapeutic use show that most people say it improves their mood. Um, I think there's a little more reason for concern in depression that in some cases, the more depressed you are, the more cannabis you smoke. Um, it can lead to problematic cannabis use and worse outcomes. So 
as is the case with many substances, uh, coping motives are, are a reason for concern and a marker for broader problems, whether those are problems specific to cannabis use or part of a larger profile of problematic substance use and negative affect, I think is a very difficult thing to tease apart. And in our reviews of non-medical cannabis use, again, higher levels of depression and anxiety in cannabis users compared to non, but it's very difficult to make a causal argument there. It could be that people with depression and anxiety are using cannabis uh, to treat it. Or it could be that there's a third factor associated with stigma or sociodemographic factors. This is particularly true, I think, when we look at some of the research on cannabis use in adolescence. So often when there are associations, they're between cannabis use and very high levels of cannabis use in adolescence. And we have to recall that amongst those uh, participants in those studies, those respondents, those are kids who are breaking the law every day. So you have to wonder what kind of parental supervision, what kind of antisocial peers, what kind of other sociodemographic factors that we know are risks for things like depression and anxiety, what kind of a role are they playing. And it's very difficult to control for those, even in statistical models that might have some kind of an index of parental supervision. It's hard to get all of that variance out there. Perhaps the most attention for cannabis and mental health comes from the use of cannabis to treat symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. In this case, there is some literature from the therapeutic use of cannabis. Uh, no clinical trials. The clinical trial data are now being collected. I think they've just wrapped up the U.S. study. I was speaking with one of the investigators from it just last weekend. Um, so they're just preparing the data there. We're still recruiting in our trial that I'll tell you about in a moment. But uh, some of the cross-sectional, and there's good animal research that I won't have time to get into, but uh, some of the cross-sectional stuff uh, shows that a lot of people with PTSD use cannabis to treat their symptoms, and, and we have to infer that they're not doing it because it makes them worse, at least in the short term. Um, and there's some pretty good stuff, particularly from incarcerated samples in Canada, uh, showing that nabilone, a synthetic cannabinoid that people prescribe in jail, uh, reduces nightmares. Of course, high levels of traumatic stress in, in jail populations. And in these cases, taking nabilone seemed to reduce nightmares. And there's a lot of anecdote that cannabis use suppresses dream activity. So one thing that we have to acknowledge when we look at the research on cannabis and the whole trajectory of cannabis, as scientists, we can study it, we can, we can share what we find, but we've really been following the patients the whole time. So it's really been the providers and the patients who have been taking dramatic risks to move this forward. And I've got a whole lot of respect for dispensary operators and, and, and medical cannabis patients who have taken those risks um, to, to address their health care needs. And, and particularly with veterans, there's been a strong advocacy, both in the U.S. and the trauma healing centers in Canada, uh, pushing to have cannabis for PTSD because vets uh, say it makes them feel better. Um, so in light of this, and in light of, I think, sympathy, well-deserved well sympathy for veterans, there's been some enthusiasm for testing cannabis for PTSD. We have a study at uh, UBC Okanagan. We're opening a new site here with the BC Center on Substance Use, where I'm, where I'm an affiliate. Uh, we're going to keep recruiting. Very difficult to recruit uh, for this study because we have a placebo arm, so people have access to cannabis. If they're suffering from PTSD, chances are they tried cannabis because it's so widely accessible. Um, why would you want to risk being in the placebo group if you have an effective treatment already? So, you know, when we first started out, people said, oh, you're, gonna, you're having a trial of cannabis, you'll have a lineup around the door. And in fact, it's just the opposite. And other people who do studies of therapeutic use of cannabis report the same thing. Uh, people find it effective, they're using it, they don't want to be part of a study, why would they bother? Um, slightly different situation in the U.S., and they are done with their recruitment there, uh, despite having a number of barriers. However, um, they have problems with their cannabis. So since we've had licensed producers in Canada, we have a benefit of being able to access reasonably good cannabis, or cannabis, good, cannabis that resembles the cannabis that medical users report satisfaction using. And there's a picture of our cannabis. This is a, this is a BC audience, so you'll recognize that as a, as a bud of cannabis. Um, you may not recognize the stuff that NIDA was producing for John Hopkins, though, that they freeze-dried after tumbling for six years. Uh, 
and that was rejected initially for having high levels of mold and mildew. Um, so there was some controversy about that and Hopkins eventually dropped the study because, um, because of a number of reasons related to the source of cannabis. And just last year we got this great report confirming what we all suspected uh, in Nature Scientific reports that the government, the single source of research cannabis in the U.S. Uh, is not uh, directly comparable with the medical cannabis that people report good effects from. Uh, some of the cannabinoids degrade over time and through storage into something that is quite different from THC uh, and we could get into some of the details of that before but I want to highlight some methodological issues about why we don't know more. Uh, there's been a monopoly on cannabis production in, in the U.S. for years. For a while that was the only cannabis we could get in Canada too. It's only since 2014 that we've had access to cannabis that resembles cannabis that's used in the world. Um, so that's our trial. Our trial is placebo controlled with two active treatments. We have a balanced THC and a CBD strain. For those of you who are unfamiliar, those are the cannabinoids that, are, uh, that have been the most well investigated. THC responsible for the, uh, for the psychoactive effects. CBD also has psychoactive effects. Uh, more subtle, probably a moderator of THC effects primarily. Um, and we're still, we're still recruiting, but the, the goal is to look at, uh, at the gold standard interview for PTSD, the CAPS. And uh, we use vaporized cannabis, which I think is an improvement over the U.S. site, which uses smoked cannabis. And we're also measuring sleep quite carefully using actigraphy, uh, because we think that that is perhaps going to be the biggest uh, mediator of effects. So one of the most, as a clinician, I've worked with PTSD, worked in the VAs in the U.S. and, and worked with PTSD, uh, PTSD here in Canada. And perhaps the most devastating symptom of PTSD is the sleep disturbance. People will spend, you know, five nights out of seven, be awoken with terrifying nightmares. And so they're afraid to go to sleep. And we all know that if you don't get a good night's sleep, it's hard to function in a good way, and, and if, if that's been going on for months and perhaps years, uh, you can imagine that the rest of your functioning uh, certainly takes a hit. So when we're looking at mechanisms of how cannabis might help for PTHD, I think it's suppression of nightmares and, and, uh, and um, accentuation of restful sleep. So we've talked about cannabis being used for anxiety and we also want to look at some comorbid conditions uh, with anxiety and we also see that there's a lot of use for pain and we know that anxiety and pain uh, dance together quite closely. In chronic pain people are often uh, prescribed antidepressants or, or anxiolytic medications um, to treat the two together and that anxiety can exacerbate chronic pain and then chronic pain related concern sometimes called pain catastrophizing, can accentuate the anxiety and we get this vicious cycle. So one of our targets, one of the things that we're, we're interested in is how does cannabis help with pain? Does it help by directly reducing inflammation? It doesn't seem to because it's not good for acute pain, but perhaps it reduces the anxiety associated with pain. So in this case, we, we, uh, we recruited from arthritis patients. We, in this case, we don't have the disadvantage of, of already uh, of only selecting people who are, who are responders to medical cannabis. And we're interested because the existing treatments for pain are not great. Um, we, all, we use Tylenol and aspirin and Advil, ibuprofen, as if they're uh, completely harmless. But that's not at all the case. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have a considerable health burden and uh, substantial mortality due to uh, gastrointestinal damage. So, um, when we're looking at the benefits and costs of different medications, we want to keep that in mind. So in this case, we had people who were using both non anti-inflammatories, opioids, and cannabis. We asked them to compare, and this is just in, in preparation now. We're, we're going to be submitting this for publication um, within the next month. That's aspirational. Hopefully, if I say it, it'll happen. Um, and we found some differences in their self-reported effects of pain. When it came to directly reducing the pain, you see we don't see any differences. Uh, I mean, there are differences in proportion, but they're not statistically significant. Um, compared to non steroidal anti-inflammatories, cannabis seemed to make the pain more bearable, less irritating, allowing people to live a normal life. And interestingly, 
it outperformed uh, both non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and opioids on the self-report uh, for making people less depressed about the pain. So it's not that the pain is necessarily better, it's that people are less concerned about it. So it creates a kind of distance from the pain. And uh, so it may be, in fact, those anxiolytic effects that are primary. And that's important given that um, so many people who struggle with pain also struggle with anxiety, which makes it worse. So we supplemented that with just a, a, a brief data collection at a local dispensary. And we found amongst people who were uh, verified cannabis users to treat, can to treat chronic pain, over 70% of them also used it to treat anxiety. So it seems like this concurrence of anxiety and chronic pain may really be where cannabis has its best effect. And that's important. Um, because our existing treatments for anxiety and pain are not great. Um, and if cannabis can serve as a substitute for some of those other medications, you know, people often say to me, what is cannabis, what is it really good for? And when I'm being glib and a little flippant, I say, you know, well, it's better than the other stuff that doesn't work. And we have a lot of widely used medications that are not terribly effective, um, but they, they, they do they have some benefit for people who are suffering from chronic conditions. And if cannabis can reduce the reliance on some of those other medications that have a worse risk profile, then I think we can see a real public health benefit. So in this study, again, we looked only at authorized medical cannabis patients. And we found that, indeed, they were reporting substituting cannabis, using cannabis instead of, rather than in addition to, other medications. Uh, in our sample, who used cannabis primarily for pain, you can see about 40% were reported replacing opioids. And, uh, but over 10% also benzos. And then if you look in the mental health condition, people are using cannabis primarily for anxiety and depression. They're also using it to replace opioids and to a greater uh, extent benzodiazepines. A lot of people who are suffering with chronic pain are using both opioids and benzodiazepines, and that's a real concern. When we look at the current opioid overdose epidemic, um, we know that benzodiazepines exacerbate the risk of opioid overdose at a pharmacological level. Um, and as a result, just a couple of years ago, the FDA put out the strong warning for opioids uh, in combined with benzodiazepines, and there's emerging evidence about some of the risks that come with benzodiazepine. And of course, I don't need to drive home again the, the magnitude of the opioid overdose epidemic that we're experiencing here in BC, so, and across Canada, across North America. So I don't think that cannabis is, in and of itself, uh, the solution to the opioid epidemic. Some people are trumpeting it that way. I don't think that's the case. I do think we need more focused research on how cannabis works as a substitute, might work as a substitute for opioids. What's remarkable is the, the extent of substitution we already see is being done ad hoc primarily. People's physicians are not encouraging them to use cannabis as a substitute, they're doing it themselves. So I think if we were to develop systematic uh, protocols for opioid substitution, we might see even better effects. And um, that's something working with the BC Center on Substance Use and MJ Malloy and others uh, to, to investigate more carefully. But we need to do something. And it's not just the data that I've shown here. We've had other stuff from our group showing substitution for prescription drugs. And the group from the BC Center, in using their really powerful cohort designs, have found that injection drug use in street-involved youth, so even very high-risk groups, uh, high rates of cannabis use are associated with lower rates of initiation of injection drug use, which we know is really a tipping point when it comes to transitioning into that really high-risk group. Uh, for opioid overdose. And it's not just uh, based on interview and cross-sectional data with cannabis users. We also see from the U.S. some reductions in medications uh, use amongst states with medical cannabis, uh, including opioids and benzodiazepines. So people are substituting it at that. There's evidence of substitution at that population level. And, um, you know, when we talk about substitution, it needn't be only for opioids and benzodiazepine, uh, I'm also very interested in how cannabis works as a substitute for alcohol. And I'll talk a little bit about some preliminary data that we have there from our UBC students. One of the big concerns that people have about cannabis legalization, what about driving? Well, um, you know, people have been using cannabis and driving before legalization. I don't expect to see an increase in that. But what we have seen is that in medical cannabis states, 
there's some um, reduction in alcohol use, and uh, that may be what is leading this apparent reduction. This is not the only study to find this reduction in traffic fatalities that concur with the initiation of medical cannabis legislation. So at an individual level, best to drive sober, of course, and not to use cannabis or any other psychoactive substance. Uh, but the risks uh, associated with cannabis driving are similar to the risks that we see with a lot of prescription medications, less risk than benzodiazepine driving. Um, so I hope that we don't uh, use driving as a new uh, focus for drug hysteria. So in summary, we see an ancient history of therapeutic use, current use for conditions related to affect and pain, potential public health uh, benefits associated with substitution, and the potential that perhaps legalization uh, through primarily through the mechanism of substitution may lead to public health benefits. So with legalization, uh, there's some in, there was interest in CIHR in funding cannabis research, and, and we were fortunate to get an award from CIHR to study um, cannabis legalization and the effects of that. Uh, we're, uh, and uh, I'll go over some of this quite quickly. As I said, it's new, re, it's new data, so um, just coming out. And there's some, certainly some caveats here. One is that even though we've had legalization for, what, a year now? Uh, we've really only had shops selling cannabis for much less than that. So there's this paradoxical uh, thing where it could be that with legalization, particularly in BC, we've seen reduced rather than accentuated access. Uh, so we're going to be following this up over the coming years now that we have shops online uh, to see what is the real influence of access. But uh, we have some signals from legalization, so I'll just share those with you. The design of the study was to look at legalization, how it affected levels of use and attitudes towards cannabis use, the thought being that levels of use might impact the use of other substances through substitution mechanisms that I've already described, and that we would see some positive psychosocial health consequences as a result of cannabis substitution, positive and perhaps negative, if cannabis is in fact a complement for other substances. So the first thing we're interested in is substitution, and we've been looking at this in undergrads for a while. This is about 1,000 UBC students, um, all of whom used cannabis and alcohol in their lifetime. Um, and if we look at the weekly use of cannabis, it went from 45% to about 40%, 41% post-legalization. So that's not statistically significant. I think it's just regular variance. But what we see is it's not an increase. And alcohol use at the same time also remains steady. So we were interested in, in what proportion of students said that they used cannabis as a substitute only f or a complement. Only 4% reported that cannabis was a complement, that they drank more alcohol when they used cannabis, and over half reported using less alcohol when using cannabis. Of course, self-report is not entirely reliable, but um, it's also not, uh, not entirely unreliable. So over half of people saying they're using less cannabis, and 10% saying that they were purposely reducing their alcohol use uh, using cannabis to reduce alcohol. So I don't want to drink tonight, I'm going to use cannabis instead. And, you know, we still, we have a bar on campus, which is, which is surprising to me, and we, I think there's a bar here, but there, I noticed there's no vapor lounge on campus. So uh, are you guys working on that, or? I know that we are at the Okanagan. Given that alcohol is certainly much more dangerous than cannabis, if it's something that could uh, be substituted, then we need to promote uh, safer alternatives through campus health. Uh, so we're working on that. Uh, as we try to understand why people would use cannabis instead of alcohol, there's a number of factors. We found, again, 25% saying they used it instead of alcohol. Slightly different question than purposely using it to reduce alcohol. And 80% of the, those folks, this is pre and post legalization, no change between 70 and 80% said they like cannabis better. Uh, avoiding hangovers was the next most common motivation, so uh, harm reduction in that way. Safer, again, harm reduction, but interestingly, this is where we saw a reduction post-legalization. So there's been a lot of messaging. One of the hopes when we, when we legalize is that we can stop this terrible partisanship where nobody believes anything. You know, everyone's either an advocate and says cannabis is going to save the world, or, or they're reefer madness. So it became, becomes very difficult to get realistic messaging out there. Uh, I think people started trusting the messaging perhaps a little bit more with legalization. So we see a reduction in the people who thought that cannabis was much safer, 
and a reduction in people who thought they should use cannabis if they were going to drive. I'm going to be, I'm the designated driver tonight, so I'll just smoke weed instead of drinking. Uh, fewer people are doing that, perhaps because there's more attention to it from roadside checks, perhaps just because there was more messaging about the danger of, of cannabis and driving. So all the reductions, the, all the changes that we see post-legalization were, were in uh, a direction of, of people feeling less like cannabis is safe and something you can drive with. We're also interested in norms because norms might be predictors of behavior, so we might not see changes in behavior right away, but maybe in attitudes. So in this case, we have about 1,500 students. Uh, again, a small, non-significant reduction in rates of past month cannabis use. So 35% post-legalization, 38%. So it's not like everybody went crazy and started smoking weed the minute it was legal. Uh, and that's was similar to what we've seen in Colorado and Oregon. Uh, almost no change in rates of cannabis use. But when you think of the norms, descriptive norms are um, describing how many people you think are using cannabis. And what we saw, see is that males, uh, pre-legalization overestimated it. Remember, it's about 38%. Post-legalization, they came a little closer to ground truth. So uh, the males dropped, and the females were right all along. So the female characterizations were accurate, and the men came closer to the truth, and this interaction is significant. Again, these are preliminary analyses. So in addition to descriptive norms, there are injunctive norms. Injunctive norms are how much do you think people approve of cannabis use? And in this case, we see this interesting interaction where men dropped in their perceived approval of cannabis use. That's the blue line. They were less likely to think that their peers approved of cannabis use, and females went in exactly the opposite direction. So it could be that some of the stigma around cannabis use was reduced uh, for females uh, and, uh, and increased for males. They no longer felt like it was cool and the, the, uh, the females felt like it was okay. I'd be interested in hearing what people think of this. this these analyses we just did a couple days ago. So uh, curious, but I, I think interesting in terms of normalization of cannabis use post-legalization. So I just want to close off with some of what we're doing now is renovating our assessments of cannabis use. Um, there's the tools that we have for assessing cannabis use. The most widely used is the QDIT, which is based on the alcohol use disorders inventory task. It follows very closely with the cannabis use disorder criteria. Um, and these are, are somewhat problematic in a legalized environment. Um, so, and, and particularly in an environment that considers medical cannabis use, we know that there is a very pronounced and undeniable uh, cannabis uh, withdrawal uh, profile. If you use cannabis every day and you stop, all of a sudden, you're going to have some withdrawal syndromes. They're similar in intensity, perhaps a little less than what you get from, um, from stopping uh, using caffeine. If you're a regular daily coffee user, try stopping. Uh, it's not pleasant. Uh, and cannabis withdrawal is similar. It lasts about up to seven days. For some people, a little longer. For most, the worst of it's in about three days. Interestingly, when we look at this Health Canada label, though, it says up to half of people who use cannabis on a daily basis have problems from using cannabis. Health problems. And what health problem would that be? We know that cannabis doesn't impact uh, or it's, it doesn't have uh, physical toxic effects. So probably the health problem would be cannabis use disorder. Um, and what are the symptoms of cannabis use disorder? It's two of the above, cravings, tolerance, and withdrawal. So I want to know why it's only half. I would think almost everyone who smokes cannabis every day would, have, uh, would meet criteria for cannabis use disorder. I would debate whether or not, in fact, it's a disorder. Uh, but nonetheless, there's going to be tolerance, withdrawal, and craving on cessation. Um, so the take home here is that I think we need a more nuanced tool to capture a fuller spectrum of cannabis use. And so that's what we've gone about uh, trying to create, the Brief Composite Cannabis Assessment Tool. It has scales for positive, therapeutic, and negative consequences of cannabis use. Um, and uh, we, it can produce a total score as well as subscales. So if we look at uh, the three scores of therapeutic use, things like substituting it for pharmaceuticals, using it to relieve pain, sleep, and nausea, are all load on the therapeutic uh, factor. The negative factor is loss of control, 
uh, ref refraining from activities, feeling bad about use, and then just a positive factor. I mean, I think that we can agree that certain behaviors uh, are pleasant and that has a value. So some people find using cannabis to be pleasant and that has a value just as other recreations like skiing or sports that may have you know, negative consequences, risk of injury, et cetera, but we value them because they're fun. And uh, lo and behold, some people think smoking cannabis is fun. Uh, it improves their mood, they like the way it makes them feel, think differently, relax. So we've done some initial factor analysis and these three factors do hold up. We're right now uh, preparing a manuscript looking at this in medical and young adult users and currently following up with um, some of the high risk cohort on the downtown east side to see how they're using cannabis and, and whether this tool is going to be more effective uh, for measuring cannabis use in that group. And finally, I want to talk about the ICE, which is the Index of Cannabis Equivalence. Uh, we have a standard drink uh, for measuring alcohol use, but we don't have a good standardized measure of cannabis use. The pharmacokinetics um, are such that it's very difficult uh, to compare edibles with smoked, with concentrates, with a bong, with a joint. There's so many different types of cannabis use, so we thought it would be best to crowdsource it and to see what do cannabis users think is a dose. And uh, what's a large dose, what's an equivalent dose? We had a large sample and many of them, uh, I think about 80% of them had used all of these different forms, so they were able to, uh, to speak to the comparison. Um, so yeah, those are the different forms, these are the ranges that we had. And here's what we found. So if you look at, and, and we broke them up by tolerance, because we thought dose would be different by tolerance. A low dose, uh, of a joint, you see people agreed that a low dose was two or three puffs of a joint, a medium dose was under 10 puffs, and a high dose uh, for the high tolerance group was, I mean, does anybody remember how many licks does it take to get to the middle of the, anyways, how many, how many puffs in a joint? I don't know, about 12. So some people are smoking a joint and a half for their high dose. Um, 10 puffs for a low tolerance group, so I guess they'd smoke a joint to themselves, that would be a high dose. Interesting with edibles, we see this big divergence where the, where the, uh, where the high tolerance group was able to eat almost 80 milligrams of cannabis I would, uh, of THC. I would not recommend that to anyone, even if you think you have a high tolerance. Um, low dose is around five, and, and if people are interested in trying cannabis edibles, they're just recently legalized. I think five milligrams of THC is a really good place to start, and uh, our sample agreed with that. And again, everyone agreed that six bong hits was plenty. <laughs> so here's the end of our equivalence. Um, you know, two puffs is a low dose, 11 puffs is a high dose. We started low because we wanted to be responsible uh, and not, not overrate, better to underestimate. Um, and when it came down to, to a single index that hopefully will be used for research, we see a standard. So this is like the cannabis equivalent of a standard drink. Uh, two puffs off a joint, two hits off a pipe or a, or a concentrate vaporizer. Herbal vaporizer is a little bit weaker. One bong hit, one quarter of a dab, for those of you who know what that is, and a five milligram edible. So we're hoping, and again, this is also in prep, uh, but we're hoping that this will be adopted as a standard cannabis unit, which is something that we very much need in the research to compare. Uh, as opposed to some of the earlier attempts, which were quite crude at looking whether someone's a cannabis user or not. It means, did you inhale any cannabis over the past week? Uh, hardly a good index. So that's it. What's next for us? We're looking at mindful cannabis use. So in a world where cannabis is legal and abstinence is not the only goal, how do we encourage people to use cannabis mindfully? So we're going to be developing interventions based on that. We're looking at the high-risk populations with the, with the downtown east side cohorts, the BC Center for Substance Use. How does substitution work amongst that group for whom it's so important to understand? We're hoping to start a study of older adults and looking at some um, health economics indices of how much does it cost to have an older adult using cannabis compared to some other medications and hoping to follow up over the longer term what happens with legalization amongst our young adult sample. And here's my lab. Uh, the people who have done most of the hard work of, from the stuff that you see here. Uh, that's Sarah who's working on mindful cannabis use. Kim who's done some behavioral economic stuff. 
Tatiana, who's working on the norms, Michelle, who's doing pain, and, and Joey, who's a former UBC Vancouver undergrad, uh, who's looking at alcohol substitution. So thank you so much for your attention. I think that, that yeah, that's a great question. Actually, we had a manuscript that we had a lot of trouble getting published uh, that's still making the rounds. I think we're refining it now. It showed that people were using cannabis as a tobacco substitute. Um, it makes sense from, a, you know, from sort of the, the topography of smoking. If you can, we know that you know, smokable uh, alternatives are, 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 and it gives you, I mean, it's so, so different than people are using so much less. I wouldn't think that someone's going to, you know, smoke several joints in an hour or something like that. But um, there's some initial signal from some of this population stuff that people are using cannabis as a tobacco substitute. It's very difficult for us to study it amongst the undergrads because there's such low levels of tobacco use, which is nice, but it's very hard to recruit smokers amongst undergrads. But I think down the road, I know that there's some interest in clinical trials of cannabis as a smoking cessation aid, uh, but that's going to be very controversial, I expect. Um, great question, though, and something we're certainly thinking about and trying to look at. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, it would be hard to find a better candidate uh, for a placebo effect than CBD, right? It's not supposed to be psychoactive. It's inferred to have miraculous effects. Um, at the same time, we know from animal models and from brain science that it does have a modulating effect on the endocannabinoid system, on the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So something is going on with CBD. There's these remarkable findings with epilepsy. Most of the best research with CBD suggests that we need very large doses of CBD in order to have an effect. Those doses would be prohibitively expensive um, if you're getting CBD from the gift store at the Colorado Hotel. So the kind of that you're getting in your CBD latte uh, are unlikely to have much of an effect. If you're using cannabis products, the mo the, uh, it seems to moderate the effects of THC and reduce anxiety. Um, and, and generally, I, you know, I hear, again, anecdote, but you hear a lot of reports from people who say that it helps with their sleep and PTSD. Um, the trials have yet to be done. Um, there's some interesting work out of Brazil that shows some very positive effects, but they're biphasic, very dose dependent. It seems like you need a high dose, but not too high. If you go either side of that, it seems to have negative effects. So I don't think there's nothing there. I think that we'll probably develop some, uh, some therapeutic agents out of CBD. I think as an adjunct to THC, it has a lot of potential, but I think the bottom line is we just don't know, and I'm sure that some of the reported effects are, are placebo. It's like microdosing. Maybe something there, but a lot, of, a lot of potential for placebo and a lot of hype. Mm. Great question, or, or several questions. I think, first of all, with the 25-year-old age uh, issue and that recommendation, I think, is frankly absurd. We use all kinds of medicines that are 
that have negative side effects. And if the potential benefits outweigh those side effects, then we use them. They don't have to be absolutely safe. The idea that we legalize something because it becomes absolutely safe after age 25, I mean, it's not the greatest brain science to say the brain stops at 25. The fact is we let people use drugs and do all kinds of dangerous things like concuss themselves, playing hockey. We're concerned about the adolescent brain when it comes to cannabis, but we stand on the sidelines and applaud when people bump into each other for what happened to the adolescent brain then. Uh, all of a sudden the concern is not so acute. But um, I think the reason we let people do things at 18 is because they're old enough to make choices about reasonable risks, not because their brain is entirely developed. Right? So if you're, it, it is the use of cannabis in people uh, 18, 19 years old uh, is, is probably not recommended, but is it, it is certainly comparable to a bunch of other risks that we allow people to take. So I think the CMA position on that is, is totally off target. It, with regard to the retrospective stuff, I think those kind of studies can be interesting, but there's so many confounds, particularly with people who used cannabis um, you know, during the times of prohibition, and one, not only the prohibition bias that, that favors certain personality profiles, people who are willing to break rules, um, but also some of the contaminants that would have been in illegal cannabis, particularly before hydroponics were prominent when we had cannabis being smuggled from all kinds of different places in different conditions. I'm surprised that we don't see more negative results just from contamination of product. But yeah, certainly there'd be value in those studies, absolutely. The third blind is from the analysis, from the people who are doing the analysis. Yeah. I have another question too, which is the pre versus post study you were doing, pre versus post legalization time, and the change in the attitudes. Have you looked into reactants that, like, you know, kind of young people, you tell them, hey, this is totally unsafe, or maybe they'll say, hey, it's fine, and now they're closing down. Yes. The uh, that, that's certainly one of our hypotheses for what we're seeing in the males. That, that, and there's some other studies, with, so there's some other findings with slightly smaller N um, showing that, that some of the men, when it looked at people they admire, the heavy male cannabis users showed the most pronounced drop in their estimates of cannabis use amongst people they admire. So it, it basically it's less cool now that it's legal amongst the men, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, I think reactance is, is probably the best candidate. Uh, for explaining those findings in, in, of a drop in perceived approval of cannabis use amongst men. Sort of still counterintuitive, but that, that would be my, my guess. Yeah, thanks. There's certainly been some longitudinal studies of youth uh, and anxiety, and have shown some exacerbation of anxiety, but it, they were not able to uh, tease that apart from uh, you know, what would be a normal, de uh, a normal development of an anxiety disorder over a normal course of anxiety over time. And you know, I think there's effects of stigma. I think that there's all kinds of factors that could lead to that, but there's not a pronounced impact of cannabis uh, exacerbate. The, the place where we see the real risk is with schizophrenia. I didn't talk about that because it's its own talk. But there is evidence that if people who have, uh, who carry a risk factor for cannabis, that would be the main risk, is that they're, they're, they do seem to be at increased uh, risk for developing a full-blown psychosis. Now it's hard to say whether, what the role of treating prodromal symptoms might be, so it's really hard to get a, a temporal uh, read on that. And so the evidence on cannabis and psychosis is very very uh, mixed and, and um, certainly a, an open topic, even now. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, well, I think that perhaps amongst people who are, it, and it goes back to some of the crudeness in measuring cannabis use. So it may be that the people who are using cannabis are feeling more comfortable using it in a social context, uh, so are not driving as much on, can uh, on alcohol because whereas they would have maintained their cannabis use at home, maybe they're going out and using it more. Um, it could be that the substitution effects are amongst the heavier users so that people are maybe, if you look at base rates of cannabis use, it's not changing, but people who would drink a lot or maybe drinking a little bit less, I, we have to get much more granular about these data. What, I, what does give me some, some encouragement from them though is that we're not seeing increases. We're not seeing increases in traffic accidents. We're not seeing in, increases in, in intoxicated driving. So I don't know how much I trust the decreases, uh, but they certainly don't point to an exacerbation of traffic, uh, traffic danger. And harder in some ways. So, I guess, why would it be the increase? So, is there really, I don't know, like it doesn't seem like, it seems like the legalization is going to be the time point that would have for an increase, but rather to endorse um, improving walking and safety. Absolutely, when, when access becomes more ubiquitous. And, and that's something that we're going to keep watching. We just haven't, we just don't, don't have data from there. I think the first cannabis store in Kelowna opened couple months ago and what has it been about six months here that this and even then there's very few stores here so far but at the same time people who may not have been accessing that way can now get through the mail and I think there's some older adults that are using um, legal so yeah it's a very muddy picture right now it's hard to get a good signal uh, about legalization but I thought I'd present the preliminary data anyhow because it did happen so if we're going to pick a date of legalization, we might as well pick the date of legalization, but those cautions are, are, are certainly accurate. Yeah. Well, you know, from cannabis uh, user advocacy groups, uh, who I think probably give us the most sensitive uh, index of cannabis users, there's a lot of concern, particularly around the eve of legalization, because many of the licensed producers were switching uh, their emphasis towards recreational cannabis and didn't have, um, didn't have product. There's been some other uh, dispensaries that have said, we're not going to shut down because our our, our patients still need us, and you know what? It's illegal now, it was illegal before too, so what's changed? Um, so there's certainly concerns that there's been reduced access, and whether or not we've seen sort of empirical data to that effect, um, I think we're still looking. We're trying to, to uh, keep a tab on those markets, but there's, it's such a moving target that it's hard to say. Anecdotally, yes, medical users feel that they've been left out and that uh, it's been a paradoxical, uh, paradoxical process where they took the risks and led the way on legalization and now they're deprived of their medication once again. So yeah, it's a good point. There have been a lot of studies. There was a recent one that just came out, I think it was an addiction from a group here that found um, really no increase in, in, in traffic fatalities associated with cannabis use. Um, the, the studies of, there, there's been some interest, interesting studies done in Europe. There's one, I mean, there's all, all the driving st simulator is a tough one. Um, it has its problems with validity. Um, you see some slower driving. There, there, I mean, I think the consensus when we look at that, that converging studies, um, some slower decision making associated with cannabis intoxication. Uh, but overall, in terms of safety, it's certainly nothing as profound as what we see with alcohol. And it's more similar to things like benzodiazepines and antihistamines. So we accept a certain level of risk when it comes to driving uh, with other substances. And I think cannabis is more akin to some of those substances that we've been able to integrate within our acceptable risk parameters than something like alcohol that has a pronounced, pronounced effect on driving risk. 
Puffs. Uh, surely there is a lot of variability in puffs mm -hmm. between individuals. So I'm wondering if there isn't a way of standardizing uh, dosage that doesn't rely on, I mean, I, I hate to think of injectable mm -hmm. agency or anything like that, but uh, yeah, I mean, is, is one of these other things better than puffs? I mean, leave out the edible. It, there's a lot of variability in, in within any of these, absolutely. And, and what we were trying to do is find something that was going to be useful for users. So when we talk to cannabis users, how do they best interpret their mode? It's puffs. As much as a puff is different. And we know from uh, certainly from the smoking literature, from the tobacco literature, that smoking topography, one inhalation, one person's inhalation is not another person's inhalation. And what a puff from a concentrate vaporizer, the same as a joint, the same as a pipe, I don't know, but that's why we decided to go sort of bottom up to see how do people conceive of these things and, and perhaps if you're, what we wanted was equivalency, so perhaps if you think of a, your puff might be different, but at least you know that, you know, you, if, if you're similar in how you take a bigger inhale from a bong, you might be someone who also takes a bigger inhale from a joint and so that they'll be at least within radar consistency, which is really what we are after. But I don't think we'll ever get to sort of the standardized drink where we can ab absolutely uh, commodify how much alcohol is in there. But again, what's in the cup is not necessarily the way that it's metabolized in the body. So there's all that variability. We want it to be the same you know, in the mouth, but really when we get to something that's the same in the brain, uh, that's a big challenge. So yeah, there's all kinds of variability, but I don't know if we're going to get meaningfully a whole lot closer than this. Milligrams of THC, trying to equate that across an edible versus uh, different modes of inhalation is really, I think, a lost cause if you were to tell someone to inhale uh, you know, 0.25 milligrams of cannabis yeah. or THC. I don't know how they do that. There's been attempts to get at a standard joint. The, the SJU, the standard joint unit, uh, it, it really, it, <laughs> this is psychology. Of course we've done something and made an acronym of it. But um, we thought that this was sort of a response to that, to get it from the user profile. Because, yeah, and then there's pictures, and you say this is a joint, and then there's a picture of a quarter, and this is how much weed is. It didn't really, it, you know, when we, when we brought it to cannabis users, it didn't have, uh, it didn't resonate as something that they would be able to use. Yes. What kind of overlap? Are there some significant differences? There were the, the differences were significant for edibles, but not for um, not for uh, joints or bong. So they're smallest for bong. But yeah, we, you know, certainly when we publish it, we'll have a, a we'll, we'll include all those kind of statistics so that people can can make those inferences. Okay, well, that's